Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture five. And in this segment, we're going to actually start introducing some mathematical uh, mechanics that go into the Coriolis force. So with that, we'll go ahead and dive right into it. So one thing that goes into this derivation of the Coriolis force is something called Earth's rotation vector. Now, there is a way to derive this, but it involves some kind of messy three-dimensional geometry that's really hard to visualize and kind of hard to draw on a computer. If you really want to know where this comes from, then I can do my best to explain it to you, but we don't really need to concern ourselves with that. The main thing that we want to focus on is this rotational vector, which basically is basically quantifies the components. If, if you think about how the Earth rotates, it basically quantifies the components of how uh, an object's angular velocity is influenced by the Earth's rotation. But we don't necessarily need to know where this comes from, but we just need to go ahead and introduce this because it will become a factor in our derivation of the Coriolis force. When using this vector up here, the Coriolis force is in fact defined as minus two omega, this, uh, this uh, omega vector, this Earth's angular velocity vector, cross product our velocity, the velocity vector of the object in question. And again, there is a derivation for this expression, but just like with this expression up here, it involves a lot of messy geometry. In fact, this one you can even use a tensor notation to derive, but we're not gonna concern ourselves with that. Uh, I'm just going to ask that you trust that these expressions are in fact accurate. So if our Coriolis force is in fact defined as the following, minus 2 omega, again this omega up here, cross the velocity vector of the object in question, then we can resolve the components of the Coriolis force by, res by evaluating this cross product. Again, keeping in mind that our velocity vector is equal to this. So we know what this vector is and we know what this vector is, so now we can actually go and evaluate that cross product which we can evaluate like the determinant, of the determinant of a three by three matrix. So if we go to evaluate that cross product, after all the messy math, we can get an expression that looks something like this. So minus two omega w, which is the vertical component of the wind, cosine phi, which is our latitude, plus two omega, uh, this time omega again is the Earth's rotation, the, Earth, the uh, angular velocity of Earth's rotation, v, a meridional wind, times the sine of our latitude phi, and that's all the i-hat component, or the zonal component of a Coriolis force, minus two omega zonal wind times the sine of latitude j-hat, so this whole thing is a meridional component of our Coriolis force, and then plus two omega u cosine latitude, and that entire thing is the vertical component of the Coriolis force. Now there are a couple things we can do to sort of simplify this expression down, because as it is right now it's kind of messy and kind of not very fun to look at. One of the simplifications we can make is more of an empirical uh, simplification. If we're working with a, remember in the previous uh, segment, we talked about how the Coriolis force is only noticeable or only significant at large scales of time and space. If we're looking at a weather system that is large enough to be significantly impacted by the Coriolis force, it turns out that the vertical motions in that weather system are very, very small, relatively speaking. Uh, just some, just some sort of some baseline numbers. If you consider uh, your average mid-latitude cyclone, your winds in the horizontal direction are going to be on the order of about 10 meters per second, but your vertical wind is going to be in a in a synoptic scale low. As an example, the vertical wind, the magnitude of that is going to be on the order of about a centimeter per second. It's a hundred times smaller. So that typically means that we can just completely ignore this component here. We can completely ignore this term that has the W in it. And also, we can sort of make a we can sort of neglect this vertical component of the Coriolis force as well. Again, this sort of goes to the same idea that I mentioned before. Most of the Coriolis deflection happens in the horizontal direction, and we know that just from observation. So usually, we can't ignore this vertical component. Technically, there is a vertical component to be considered, and this is usually the Coriolis deflection that you would get at the equator. But usually we can't ignore that. For most of our most of our intensive purposes, we can completely disregard the vertical component of the Coriolis force. So if we apply those two simplifications, we get an expression that's a lot easier to work with. And another thing that you'll see to sort of simplify this down even further is you'll often see what's referred to as the Coriolis parameter, which is given by this lowercase f, and that's defined as two times omega. Again, omega is at Earth's angular velocity times the sine of the latitude that we're at. And if we make that substitution, we get that Coriolis force is equal to Fv. Again, F is given up here, i hat. Again, that's the zonal direction, the zonal component of the Coriolis force. Uh, 
minus f times u. I didn't want to read those two letters in sequence because of things, because of uh, how that might be interpreted. So this is going to be minus f times u. Again, f is given up here, and that's the component of the Coriolis force that acts in the meridional direction. And a few things that should be noted about this Coriolis parameter, f. In the northern hemisphere, by convention, we define uh, latitudes in the northern hemisphere to be positive values of latitude. So 30 degrees north would be positive 30 degrees, 60 degrees north would be positive 60 degrees when we're going to plug in an angle into the sine function here. And since our angle is positive, that means that our Coriolis parameter also has to be positive if we're in the northern hemisphere. Conversely, in the southern hemisphere, we define uh, southern hemisphere latitudes to be negative. So 30 degrees south would be negative 30 degrees when we go to plug an angle into the sine function up here. And then 60 degrees south would be negative 60 degrees. And since we're plugging a negative angle into the sine function here, that would give us a negative Coriolis parameter. So the main takeaway message is in the northern hemisphere, your Coriolis parameter should be positive. In the southern hemisphere, your Coriolis parameter F should be negative. And then at the equator, the Coriolis parameter should be zero because sine of zero degrees is just zero. So if we think about, say, a wind that's purely in the zone direction, so this is just a check to make sure that the math does in fact match up with our conceptual understanding. So let's say we have a wind vector that's pointing purely in the zonal direction, it's pointing due east. That would mean that we expect the Coriolis force to be pointing due south. Remember, Coriolis force acts to the right of an object's motion. If an object is moving to the east, that means the Coriolis force must be directed to the south, that is, to the right of the object's motion. So if we have a purely zonal flow pattern, meaning the magnitude of this vector v is just equal to u, that means we have no Vernier component, which means this term goes away. So we're all we're left with is, all we're left with is minus, this minus f times u term. And if we're in the zonal direction, u is positive. And if we're in the northern hemisphere, f is positive. So we have a positive times a positive here times this negative. So we have a Coriolis force that acts in the negative j hat direction. Negative j hat direction means we're going in the negative meridional direction, which means based on the meteorological convention we defined in lecture one, that means our Coriolis force should in fact be directed toward the south, which matches up with our conceptual framework. And if we want to see how all these apparent forces go into our equation of motion, which is what we've been adding to uh, from the beginning of, or from lecture two, really. So again, we have our momentum advection terms. We have our pressure gradient force. These two terms right here, that is in fact the centrifugal force terms. This right here is gravity. And then this plus FV, that's the X component of the Coriolis force. This minus F times U, that's the Y component of the Coriolis force. And then Again, this term, which you can usually neglect, but for the sake of completeness, I decided to include it. Include it to u times omega times cosine phi. That is the z component of the Coriolis force. So that's going to do it for this segment. Uh, in the next segment, that would mostly just be an exercise to sort of check your understanding. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.